One of my favorite musical groups is the band U2. And one of my favorite songs that they sang is a song simply entitled Grace. And it starts like this. Grace, she takes the blame. She covers the shame, removes the stain. It could be your name. It's the name of a girl. It's also a thought that could change the world. The title of our lesson this morning is Grace Changes Everything. We're going to be in the book of Hosea, so please, at this time, let's be turning there. I think that most of us are familiar with the history of the people of God. How in some ways the highlight of all of the times of Israel was during the kingships of David and Solomon. David would have begun reigning about 1,000 B.C. His son Solomon would have essentially taken the throne about 950 B.C. But then after Solomon came to power and the glory days came, there was division in the kingdom around 900 B.C. The northern ten tribes became known as Israel. The southern tribe, Judah, was simply known as Judah. Time passes, and it seems that Israel becomes worse and worse. Well, Judah has its ups and downs. We understand that by 722 B.C., Israel, the ten northern tribes, are taken into exile by the Assyrians. But the date of this particular book and the prophecies within it probably are that time period between 780 B.C. and the exiling of Israel. Let's look. At chapter 1, verse 1, grace changes everything. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Bari, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. It's very interesting right here. It says the word of the Lord that came to Hosea. The actual Hebrew right here is the word of the Lord that was in Hosea during the reigns of the four kings of Judah and the one king that's mentioned, Jeroboam. Now this is kind of interesting because in this particular time period, his fellow prophets would have been Isaiah and Amos. Pretty awesome, huh? And we find the dating of this is particularly interesting because we find the overlap during the kingship of Uzziah and Jeroboam However, during the other years in Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah, uh, Jeroboam has died. Now, some things that are very interesting in this particular thing is, number one, Jeroboam reigns until the 38th year of Uzziah. So, we find that Hosea is preaching the word during Jeroboam's time. Now, Jeroboam's a very interesting person because he's part of the dynasty of Jehu. And Jehu, when he, in his zeal, retook the throne away from Ahab and his evil, the Bible says that God promised him to the fourth generation that his sons would sit on the throne of Israel. And they did that. Jeroboam was the second to last king, but his son Zechariah was only on the throne for about six months. And so the only one that's noted right here is Jeroboam. After that, the whole history of Israel just goes super downhill, and then they're taken into exile. On the contrary, though, they had some great kings in Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And it was in the fourth year the Assyrians came against Israel during Hezekiah's reign. But, of course, Hezekiah and Isaiah stood strong. And, of course, they did not take Judah. Now, with that in mind, we now understand that Hosea had one of the longest ministries in the history of the Bible. Most likely, his ministry would have stood for about 50 to 70 years that he was preaching the word. And yet his life is a very powerful life that preaches to this day. Let's begin in verse 2. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, take yourself an adulterous wife and children of faithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. 
So I married Gomer, daughter of Deblain, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the king of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Laruhamah, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to the house of Judah, and will save them, not by the bow or sword or battle, or by horses or horsemen, but by the Lord their God. After she had weaned Laruhamah, Gomer had another son. The Lord said, Call him Loami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Some very liberal scholars look upon the account of Hosea as being strictly allegorical. But it would be really silly to do that and then to list the times of the kings that he preached. This is a real prophet, guys. And yet he has a very unique command of God. The first thing it says, when he began his ministry, God says, it's time to get married. But you're to go and take an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness. Now, some have thought, well, he would go marry some woman that was already committed. No, no, that's not what it's about. The Bible says right here in verse 3, after the command, so he married Gomer. Now, that's quite a name in of itself. Amen, guys. (laughs) Now, we understand Hosea means salvation. So there's an allegory in his life that we're meant to understand. But bottom line, it's a real man who is a young prophet, he's given the command of God. He says, I want you to go marry this woman. And someday, she is going to be adulterous to you. Not only is she going to be adulterous to you, but she will even have children that are not your children. That's what he understood going into the marriage. And so the Bible then goes through each one of the children. He says, call the first son Jezreel. Well, what does Jezreel mean? It means those who scatter. And, of course, the whole idea here is that Israel is going to be scattered. The second one was a daughter, and her name was Laruhamah, which simply means not loved. And, of course, the Lord says, I do not love Israel anymore because they departed from me. And then the last one is a son called Laruhamah, and it means not my people because, and most scholars agree on this, This was not Hosea's son. Is that intense or not? And so right here, this is how he begins his ministry. Well, the Bible goes on, and we see the allegory part of it in chapter 2. It says, verse 1, Say of your brothers, my people, and say of your sisters, my loved one. Rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her fate and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her naked and make her as bare as on the day she was born. I will make her like a desert, turn her into parched land, and slay her with thirst. I will not show my love to her children, because they are children of adultery. Wow, he lays it out, amen? But look what happens in the account. They break up, and we read in chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord said to me, Go, show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I brought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me for many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man. And I will live with you. Wow. So here we are. The young prophet, the young preacher marries this woman. He has a couple children with her. Then the third child is not even his kid. They totally break up. The Bible says she goes totally in the world, becomes adulterous, even by inference, a prostitute. And so it was a tough enough command. He says, hey, you're going to marry a woman that commits adultery. Now he gets an even tougher command. After she's committed adultery, now he tells Hosea, now you need to go back and show your love for your wife. Is that intense or not? Now, I kind of picture this since she'd become a prostitute. That when he first gets the message, he's torn inside. Yes, I mean, we all want that happy, romantic ending to our marriages. Amen, guys? But, I mean, this woman had just shamed him, had spurned his love. And so I picture him 
after the command of God, seeking her out. And perhaps she's there where they sell the women because of prostitution. And you can just imagine, he sees her and just is taken aback at, at how she looks, her hair unkempt, dirty, scantily clad. And then as she's just there, totally numbed out by life and all of her adulteries, she sees him. She's totally taken aback and just, just overwhelmed because she remembers the goodness that he had showed her. And then when the bidding starts, the Bible says that he was able to get her for really a small amount of money, 15 shekels of silver and a homer list at the barley. And of course, that parallels the fact that her life had really come to mean very little. Though the prophet had paid the price, had paid the ransom for her freedom. Amen? And you can just imagine the reunion. I mean, here she is. I mean, had been the adulterous woman, the prostitute, and now... Hosea comes and takes her back. He says, come back to my home. He says, if you're faithful to me, I will be faithful to you. Is that incredible right there? The Lord's allegory is very simple. Hosea represents salvation. It represents God. Gomer, and what a name that is, represents us. We were destined to have a relationship with God, but we turned away from God in our adulteries. And yet God still wants us to have a relationship with him if we'll but come back to him. Why? Because he's paid the price. Amen, church? Now, look at verse 4 of chapter 3, and we see an incredible prophecy right here. For the Israelites will live many days without a king or a prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or idol. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. Wow, this is an incredible prophecy right here. He says there is going to be a time that the Israelites come back to God. And when is it going to be? It's going to be in the last days. Now, that prophecy of in the last days was said by another fellow prophet, Isaiah, right? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah 2, verse 1. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the last days. The mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, we understand that right here, the concept of mountains in the Old Testament is parallel to kingdoms. And Isaiah is prophesying here in about 750 B.C. He says, there is going to be a day that the mountain Lord, the kingdom of God, is going to be more powerful than any of the surrounding kingdoms. Well, up to this point, of course, they understood the kingdom to be Israel itself. It says Israel is going to be as glorious. It's going to be far more powerful than all of the surrounding kingdoms kingdoms. And where's this going to start? It's going to start there in Jerusalem. And then all nations are going to stream into this kingdom. Amen, guys? Now, let's go to the fulfillment of the prophecies. Go to Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, the setting is simple. Jesus has died. He's resurrected on the third day. He spent 40 days with the faithful 11 apostles. He goes up to heaven and then the faithful 11 apostles and the other disciples are waiting to see what the Lord is going to do. They're in prayer. And then we simply read, beginning in chapter 2, verse 1, these words. Remember, grace changes everything. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They seemed... They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard him speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking aliens? 
then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parinthians and Medes and Elamites. Restless of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene. This is from Rome. Both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed. They ask, what does this mean? Somehow we made fun of them and said, eh, they just had too much wine. Here it is, the Feast of the Pentecost. Supposed to be one of the highlights of the celebration of Jehovah God. And when they hear the disciples of Jesus speaking in other languages they hadn't studied before, their explanation is, eh, they just had too much to drink. That's how far Israel had gotten from God. That is how adulterous the so-called people of God had become in that day. I mean, what a setting this was. The Bible says it was the Pentecost. Now, we understand the Pentecost is the feast of the first harvest. And, of course, we understand what's happening right here is God is giving birth to the first harvest, the church. Amen, guys? Well, very interesting. We find that during each one of the three main feasts, the Jews were commanded to come back to Jerusalem. And so the, the Jews that have been dispersed through the ages in all the surrounding nations, they came back to worship God on this day. God had planned all along that there would be an incredible harvest of souls on the day of Pentecost. And so in that little room where the disciples sat around, all of a sudden on that fateful morning, there was this blowing of a violent wind. You can just imagine. Whoosh, they didn't see anything. doesn't say they felt anything. They just heard this sound. And then all of a sudden they saw this ball of fire in the middle of the room. Now you know something's up right there. Amen, guys? Then the ball of fire explodes. And ball, balls of fire sit on the heads of each one of the disciples. And no, that's not why Carlos is bald. He was not there. <laughs> but they have these balls of fire sitting right there. And then all of a sudden, they go out in the streets and they start preaching in other languages they never studied. And the people were stunned. They go, wow, I, I hear these guys speaking in my language. But they just... Stupid Galileans, uneducated Galileans. How, how, what, what's going on right here? It's must be, something's incredible. Ah, they just had too much to drink. Well, let's look what Peter says, verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, you suppose? It's only nine in the morning. Now, that's an argument for you right there, isn't it? Since it's even too early to get drunk here on Pentecost. It's nine in the morning. No. This is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days. Well, there it is again. He says, this is actually a fulfillment of the phrase, in the last days. In the last days, God says... I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Wow. In the last days. Well, we understand what the last days is all about. It's the last days of physical Israel and the temple of Herod. We understand that by 70 AD, Titus comes against Jerusalem with an with a population of about 1.1 million people, Titus slaughters a million of them and takes 100,000 away into slavery. Jerusalem is totally decimated. Judaism has never returned to what it was. The nation of Israel is, so to speak, wiped off the map. Why? God doesn't need a physical Israel anymore because he was giving birth on this day to a spiritual Israel, we know it as God's church. Amen, guys? So Peter continues to preach, and he ends his preaching in verse 36 of chapter 2. Remember, there are thousands of people here gathered for the Pentecost from all different nations. He says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard it, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, well, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41. 
Those who accept this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The church of God was born on the day of Pentecost. I mean, it's obvious right here. For the first time, people came together who were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, communion, and to prayer. That is the church. And it's really pretty powerful right here. Because the prophecy of Hosea said, in the last days, people are going to come trembling back to God. Isaiah says, in the last days, I'm going to establish my kingdom as greater than any other kingdom around. Now, they all thought it was the physical nation of Israel, but it wasn't. It was spiritual Israel, the church. And the Bible says that all nations would stream into it. And even that day, people from all sorts of nations got baptized and came into spiritual Israel, the church. Amen, guys? Well, we got to question ourselves. What, 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 what motivated them? Well, look at verse 36. It says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. You know, in that day, sometimes people were slow to follow Jesus, as they are in this day. And people can say, hey, you need to follow Jesus. Jesus is what life is all about. He came that we might have life and have it abundantly. But, you know, sometimes it just kind of bounces off people's hearts. Like some of you that have been studying for three, four, five weeks and months. See, bottom line, Peter understood how to motivate people. You're not going to appreciate the good news of Jesus Christ until you understand the bad news of your life. And the bad news of your life is your sins crucified Jesus Christ. When you understand you personally were responsible for crucifying Jesus, it's going to hit you. It's going to, it's going to take you back. And right here, these people believe that Jesus was the resurrected God. They said, well, we believe, now what do we do? And Peter says in verse 38, well, you got to repent. you got to turn away from your sins, and you got to become a disciple. you got to turn to light. And then you need to be water baptized to have your sins forgiven and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says in verse 41 that those who received his message, they were baptized and they were devoted. Amen, church? You know, it's, it's incredible, the prophecies of God's word and how they all come together. But our first point is very simple. Grace motivates. You know, so often we, we look at the drama that, that unfolded in Israel. And later in Judah, as they went into exile in about 606 B.C. And we, we go, well, why? Why would, was God so upset that he would send First, Israel into exile, and then Judah into exile. Well, it's quite simple. We understand the zeal of God. Now, in Hebrew, the word zeal and jealousy are the same word. And humanly speaking, we sense that. You know, when we get married, and it was, it was awesome, just a couple weeks ago, having Chad and Aaron get married. Amen, church? The expectation is when you get married, you are for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. Amen, guys? Forsaking all others. That's the vow that's been taken through the generations. But when someone strays from that vow, it's devastating. It's debilitating. It causes a wound and an anger. And when we become adulterous, when we love the world, when we play the prostitute, turning away from the love of God, God in his zeal, God in his jealousy says, okay, now I'll leave you to your own devices and see what your life is all about. It's a powerful thing that God does right there. Really, in his love. See, grace motivates. Last Sunday, I don't know about you, when I saw those five baptisms, they were each really incredibly special. I mean, the young man, Tivo from UCI, I mean, that was, that was awesome. 
I mean, he gets up there, and I was kind of expecting just, you know, he's a young man. And UCI is viewed as being a little bit more intellectual institution, particularly compared to Fullerton, you know. And, and so I was expecting a... I was really kind of expecting more of, you know, of a deliberate address. I mean, this young man got out there and passionately talked about his decision for Christ. Th- then, there, then there was Gabby, the young mom from the Latin ministry. It was great talking to her husband afterwards. I mean, he was really impacted. It was incredible. And then there was Terrence and Kirsten getting baptized. I mean, that was, that was awesome. I will never forget Kirsten trashing Michael Williamson for his pink shirt. <laughs> That's right. Notice that he's not wearing pink today. <laughs> but I, I, got, I, got, I got taken aback on all those batches. But when Bridget got up there and, 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 and tried bravely to speak and then became just overwhelmed and just broke down in tears. You know, I've never found a group of people like you people. I've never seen anything. I've never had friends like you and her mom sitting right there and I mean both of them are just crying going wow it's the kingdom of God why did they make the decisions each one of these people from different walks of life with different challenges in their life because they believed that Jesus died for them they understood They had played the adulterer. They had prostituted themselves to the world. And yet, God in his love had come to buy them back through the blood of Jesus. Is that incredible or not? See, we need to understand that grace motivates. Number two, grace does not negotiate. Turn to Titus chapter 2. This is incredible. Verse 11. I'm not sure I'd been impacted by a verse like this for a while. In Titus 2 verse 11, Paul writes to the young evangelist, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now this is written in the mid-60s A.D. Paul is stating very, very forthrightly, the world should be evangelized. The grace of God has appeared to all men. But look what it says. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, get this, eager to do what is good. Eager to do what is good. You know, when you understand the grace of God and you so appreciate what God's done for you, you're going to say no to worldly passions. When you're tempted to ask out a girl in the world for a date, you say no to worldly passions. When a guy in the world hits upon you at work or at school, you say no to worldly passions. When you're tempted to look at the internet because of the, the, the lewd pornography that's there, you say no to worldly passions. When you're tempted to spend your money for worthless things and become undisciplined in your finances, you say no to worldly passions. But one of the ones that we have the toughest time saying no to is the passion inside of us that just wants to hold on to a grudge. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. You know, when someone hurts us, I mean, hurts us bad, they need to pay. They need to feel. We read this in Matthew chapter 18 about forgiveness. Verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, 
Not seven times, but 77 times. Get that, guys? He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. That's millions of dollars. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children, all that he had, be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be, be, be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay you back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. That's only a few bucks. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay her debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that was owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Yeah, that's a big thing right there. You've got to forgive from your heart. I'm reminded having my uh, dear son right here that from time to time I had, I had, I had two boys. And they're pretty close in age, Sean and Eric. And from time to time, I'm sure it doesn't happen to your family, but they really got into it. <laughs> and, you know, as a parent, you have to step in there and you got to say, okay, now, you did wrong. Apologize to each other. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not good enough, is it? It's got to be from the heart. It's got to be, I'm sorry. Amen. That didn't happen all the time, but amen. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> you know, this, this parable by Jesus is such common sense. The one servant had a debt of millions of dollars. He's about to be thrown into prison with all of his family. His whole life is to be ruined. And he begs for forgiveness, and the master gives it. He's forgiven of millions of dollars. But then he goes out, and there's this guy that only owes him a few bucks. And this guy says, please forgive me. Give me some more time. He says, absolutely not. And then God recalls that dude back on in. And he says, listen, you need to understand that forgiveness is a matter of salvation. Amen. As much as faith and repentance and baptism is a matter of salvation, so is forgiveness. It's not optional. It's not optional. You know, I thought it was uh, so powerful right here at the beginning of the service to see the revoltus up here. I mean, it, it's incredible. I, I remember a year ago when Ronnie, I mean, he got restored. It was, it was amazing. And when he got restored, then he picked up this fighter, Frankie Gomez, who, you know, just won the Olympic trials. That's pretty awesome. But better than that, he was just named the captain of the entire Olympic boxing team. Is that awesome? You talk about someone, God blessing someone's repentance, that's pretty awesome right there. But it took a year for Michelle to really see, is this guy for real? Is he just saying it, or is he for real? You know something? Ronnie was for real. And, I mean, it was, it was, it was awesome. I got to sit in at the very end of the uh, cost-counting time with uh, Elena and Kathy there at the hometown buffet. We all felt we needed to celebrate with dessert. But, I mean, just, just to see Michelle's happiness. I mean, when you get rid of, of that grudge, just that hardness of... Heart. You know what I'm talking about? You ever, you ever felt that, that hardness of heart? When you get rid of it, I mean, it, it feels so awesome. And it was, it, was, it was such a wonderful thing to see Michelle then as well as today. I mean, it seemed like, like just a, a, a young woman. Just giddy. Giddy over her husband, even though he had royally messed up. But she understood that for her to come back to God... She had to give forgiveness. It's a matter of salvation. You know, it's interesting to me. In the passage, 
in Acts chapter 2, it says, your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. One of the things I think that stops us sometimes of forgiving each other and sometimes even ourselves. That's a tough one, isn't it? Sometimes just forgiving ourselves of the rotten things we've done. Sometimes we, we, we kind of buy into the world's phrase, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, first of all, people aren't dogs, amen, guys? But the Bible says that, yes, in the kingdom, the young men will see vision. But your old men will dream dreams. Look at even what Hosea says about it back in the book of Hosea, chapter 2. Beginning verse 14 of chapter 2. This is talking about God. After Israel, so to speak, had prostituted themselves away from God, the husband. It says in verse 14 of chapter 2. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and will speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards. I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. Is that awesome? Now the valley of Achor means the valley of troubles. And it says through the valley of troubles will now come a door of hope. Isn't that so true? That often it's, it's when your life gets so troubled that you, you're looking for a door of hope. You need a door of hope. And the Bible then uses the analogy of Israel being a young woman who comes out of Egypt, of course, in the Exodus. That, yes, she is going to be young again. You know, I think one of the things that is most needed in God's people and most needed in our church is a belief that grace changes everything and that everyone can change. Even the old guys. We saw a movie last night, Gran Torino. And Clint Eastwood was classic. You know, the old guy, you know, super prejudiced, had a name for every ethnic group. And he tried so hard to be bitter with those people next door. He wanted to hate him. He wanted to hold a grudge because life had been so rotten to him, he just lost his wife. But daggone it, they were nice to him. And they offered him food and free beer. Well, over time, he falls in love with them. And he even gives up his life for them. And I just thought to myself, if Clint Eastwood can change, anybody can change. <laughs> now we understand it's a movie. We understand he's an actor. But that was the whole point of the movie. It's a worldly movie that moves us. Why? Because we so often don't believe. We don't believe our parents will ever change. Our neighbors, our boss, our schoolmates, our husband, our wives, our children. We, sometimes, sometimes it's such a lack of faith, we, we don't think that we can ever change. But this is the kingdom of God and grace changes everything. That's what it means to be in God's kingdom. Well, you know, in that passage back in Titus, it said that we're to say no to ungodliness. And that's true, and we're to be motivated by the grace of God. But so often, sometimes our, 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 our Christianity can sometimes get to be kind of a list of do's and don'ts. You know what I mean? Instead of a passionate heart to serve and please God. But that's what's cool about verse 14. It says that, yes, we're going to take a stand against all wickedness and purify ourselves. But we're going to be eager to do what is good. I mean, eagerness comes from the heart, does it not? You know, it was, uh, it was very awesome on uh, Friday night. We picked up uh, our son, Sean, at the airport. And just at that time, 
Matt Sullivan was coming in at the airport, and so we got to meet each other. And uh, it, was, it was so great to, 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 to see Matt. But, and of course, you know, Sean lives on the East Coast, and so 11 o'clock our time is 2 a.m. out there. So, you know, he came on in, looked pretty good, and I said, well, how's, how's day? He says, oh, man, it's been long. I got up at 4.30. So I'm confused. That's like 1.30 our time. So I go, I bet he's just dead tired. But, you know, wanting to, you know, be hospitable and everything. I said, well, well son, are you hungry? Eyes just lit up. <laughs> Goes, yeah, I'm, I'm hungry. I said, well, where do you want to go? In and out. <laughs> so Elena was about to give us both a, a little sermon on how, how unhealthy it is to eat late at night. So I said, there's an in and out right next to the airport. He goes, okay, let's go. So we head on over the in and out. I have never seen such a packed in and out in my life. They were in, but they didn't come out. I mean, the cars were just wrapped around the block. So we drive through the parking lot. It takes about five minutes to negotiate that. And, and Sean goes, there's just too many people here. I'm going, oh, well, have to go back. He says, is there another in and out we can go to? <laughs> sure enough, we found another in and out. Right. I mean, eagerness finds a way, does it not? <laughs> and you're probably wondering, did I indulge? <laughs> Well, no, and yes. Yes, I got it animal style. But I did not indulge. I did not have the French fries. I just had the Diet Coke, amen? You see, eagerness drives us from the heart. You want something, you're going to go get it. See, when your Christianity starts to become a list of do's and don'ts, you find yourself starting to become numb. And numb is dangerous. About a month ago, my sister went in to a dentist, had her tooth extracted, and they put a titanium implant in there. The next day, her whole side of her face became numb. They took it out. They thought that might help, but it didn't. It stayed numb. Well, I was just at the house uh, yesterday. I said, Dana, how's it feeling now? She said, well, it's a little bit of pain. She was happy that the pain had returned. Why? See, a lot of us think the opposite of love is hate or pain. But the opposite of love is not. The opposite of love is numbness. And when your Christianity gets reduced to obeying simply a set of rules, and that numbness comes and and you've even drifted beyond pain, you're in trouble spiritually. See, when you feel pain, and sometimes the, difficult, the Christian life is difficult, is it not? Feeling pain's good because we're, you're still in the struggle. When you don't feel the pain and you're just numb, now you're in danger of falling away. But we need to understand. Yeah, grace motivates. But grace does not negotiate. Last point, grace communicates. You know, in my study, I stumbled across something I don't believe I I preached about before. Well, I'm going to share it with you. Turn with me, please, to 2 Kings chapter 14. You remember that the only king that was listed in Israel versus the four kings in Judah... was in fact Jeroboam. And we read about him in 2 Kings 14, verse 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Syria and reigned 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Sea of Araba, in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from gath Hefer. I go, whoa. Yeah, during that time period that Hosea was preaching, there was Isaiah, 
There was Amos. But there was Jonah. Jonah was a prophet during the time that Hosea was. Well, we got to turn on over then to the book of Jonah. Well, how do we know it's the same guy? Well, look at verse 1, chapter 1. The word Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. It's the same guy. Jonah, son of Amittai. See, a lot of people think the story about Hosea is simply allegorical. It's not. It was a real prophet. I mean, people think about Jonah getting swallowed by the big fish. They think that one is just a fish story. No, it really happened to a real guy. And it's very interesting right here. We learn a lot from Jonah. The Bible says right here, and it's very interesting. What is his challenge? What is he commanded to do? God says, Jonah, I want you to go preach to the city of Nineveh. Now, that goes over a lot of people's heads. But if I told you this, that Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, that was the arch enemy of Israel, that in time was going to send it into exile, then you go, wow, that could be a challenging assignment. And so when he gets an assignment he doesn't want to do, when he gets overwhelmed, he goes, I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm hopping a boat and going to Tarshish. Now, Tarshish was out in Spain. It was clear on the other side of the Mediterranean. God wanted him to go to Nineveh. He says, I'm heading for Tarshish. You ever felt that way when God called you? You're going the other direction? <laughs> well, as the song goes, you can run, but you cannot hide. He gets in that boat, and you know the account. It starts to be stormy. So what's he do? The first thing he do? He tries to go down in the hole of the boat and sleep it off. You know, how, how often we try to slide by getting sleep. More and more sleep. That often sends us into deeper and deeper depression. Finally, the guys in the boat, I mean, it's just a crazy storm the Lord has sent upon them. And they're trying to find out, why is this storm here? They knew it had to be a reason. They get Jonah and said, Jonah, why is this storm? He says, it's me. He says, what the heck did you do? He says, just throw me overboard and it'll all be fixed. No, no, no. Then it gets really stormy. He goes, okay, shh, we toss him on in. And he goes, it goes like that. I mean, like that. In the meantime, there's Jonah and all of a sudden, whoosh, the big fish came and got him. Well, now, how was he feeling about being inside of that fish? Well, look at chapter 2, verse 1. Now, it's a little squishy in there, but verse 1. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Let me tell you something. You be inside a fish, you be praying to the Lord your God, too. He said, in my distress, I called the Lord, and he answered me. God had to send him into a terrible distress. A storm wasn't enough. They had to toss him into the sea, and a big fish had to swallow him. From the depth of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. <laughs> he didn't realize he was already inside the fish at this point, but Amen. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, O Lord. And my prayer rose to you to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Holy cow. Those who cling to worthless idols who make God jealous. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have found out will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord, and the Lord commanded a fish, and it vomited Jonah on the dry land. Amen. Now that's a cranking end of your prayer. <laughs> he prays, okay, God, I'm ready to serve you again. He says, okay. <laughs> He's sitting all the goo there. But the Lord was kind of good because he vomited on the dry land. And the goo comes off you better when you're on the dry land and everything. Well, what happens? Well, he understood the grace of God. He knew he should have died. He wasn't obedient to God. So what does he do now? Verse 1, chapter 3. 
Then the Lord came to Jonah a second time. You ever felt that way? That's what grace is. It's a second chance. A fifth chance. A twelfth chance. A twenty-second chance. A seventy-eighth chance. That's what grace is. The word of the Lord came to him a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it, the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started in the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast and all of them from the greatest of least put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from the throne, took off his royal clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, sat down in the dust, and then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. And this was the very enemies of Israel. Who would have guessed going to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and the whole city repents, including the king. King says, okay, guys, everybody get on sackcloth and ashes, including the animals. Now, that's a serious repentance right there. I mean, when you repent, you get the dog going. Okay, dog, you're not eating either. Goldfish? Nope, you're not having anything. (laughs) This was a serious repentance by the king of Nineveh. It's crazy. The whole city repented. Now you can read chapter 4. Believe it or not, Jonah has a little bit of a bad attitude and everybody came around. It's a whole other lesson. We're not going to go there. All we want to say is grace communicates. When you're grateful, you're going to speak. You're going to obey the word of God because you want to. You know, it's exciting to be able to see that the word of God is going out from this place. I can't wait for next Sunday when we all get together and we have people from scores of nations come and visit the City of Angels Church. It's going to be great for them, but you know something, guys? It's going to be great for all of us to see that we are really in God's new movement. What was so exciting, just talk about going all the way to Tarshish. We just got news two weeks ago. That a, a group of brothers have taken a stand in Siberia. Wow. In Russia, Siberia. That's, that's further out than Tarshish. <laughs> a group of brothers have come and they've asked us to be a part of the sold out discipling movement. Wow. And now we have a church, a sister church in Siberia, Russia. Does that fire you on up? <laughs> we just got news this week that a group of brothers in Ethiopia... Remember the Ethiopian eunuch, the treasurer guy? The entire church in our former movement, they said, listen, we want to be a part of a movement. We want discipling. We want to evangelize the world in this generation. The whole church in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, has come into the new movement. Is that exciting or not? (laughs) See, God God is moving in unprecedented ways. This week, we'll be meeting with the central leadership and formalizing even more specific plans about going to all the major cities of the nations of the world. And of course, with our five-year plan, one of those cities is Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, it's exciting because Chris Van Staten, who is South African, had to go back. And of course, that's kind of like a little bit like uh, Jonah being sent back. Uh, But he had to go back to Johannesburg because of his papers. And so this next week, he's going to be starting the Johannesburg International Christian Church. But we still needed somebody that could be a trained evangelist to be able to go. And we could prepare a mission team to go. And so a couple of weeks ago, in going to Syracuse, New York, and participating in the evangelism seminar there, I had the opportunity to sit down with Andrew and Patrick Smelly of the new planting in Washington, D.C. And they have been doing a blow-away job down there. And you got to understand, I mean, they happen to be uh, an African-American couple. Yeah. Uh, here they are at the time of Obama. I mean, what a time to be in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Yeah. 
Both of them graduates of Cornell and Ivy League schools. She happens to be a lawyer to boot. And they've given it all up to go and preach the word there in D.C. That was their dream. And I sat down to them. I said, man, you guys have been doing so awesome. You're doing so awesome that we need you for something else. I said, what we'd like to do, I'd like to invite both of you to move to Los Angeles for a year and a half, starting January 1, and then collect a team right there, and in the summer of 2011, take a team and plant it in Johannesburg, South Africa. You then... You then will become, so to speak, the world sector leaders for the entire continent of Africa. All 40, 45 nations in there. Andrew goes, hey, man, bro. <laughs> Patricia starts bawling, and just crying her eyes out, you know, because of the price of the dream. Leaving the dream they had, that, that's really going awesome. I mean, even, even... That day they announced it, just announced it last Thursday. Uh, it, it was awesome. They just baptized the young man who is the president of the Omega Sci Fi fraternity there in one of the campuses. I mean, they're doing an incredible job impacting people. And I mean, but to see Patrick cry, I said, Well, why don't you pray about it? They prayed. Two days later, they both called and said, Bro, we are ready to go. And we cannot preach, go anywhere, do anything, give up everything, and not be willing to do it. Some say the kingdom is built on dreams, but really the kingdom is built on broken dreams. You putting aside your personal dreams so you can help fulfill God's dream to evangelize the world in this generation. You know, it's exciting, and many people have said, well, okay, what are we going to do with D.C.? That's such a key planting for us. Well, the Holy Spirit has moved there, too, because the Holy Spirit is going to be sending Carlos and Lucy Mejia to be the new leaders of the Washington, D.C. church. Amen? And so they're going back into the full-time ministry. Is that exciting or not? You see, yes, in the kingdom, God gives vision to the young men. But also, in the kingdom, even old men can dream. You know, when Andrew and Patrick come, it's not just, they're just not going to come and hang around the fellowship. They're going to bring a small little group with them. We're going to give a small little group over there. And uh, they're going to be coming and starting the Cross and Switchblade ministry. They're going to be coming, starting the South Central region and our outreach to the University of Southern California. Amen. Is that awesome? See, God is, God is moving in incredible, incredible ways. And I think, when you think about it, it's, it's amazing. Why, why would Andrew and Patrick give up everything, even their Ivy League, and go into the ministry? Well, grace changes everything. Why would the Mejias that have never left L.A. go to Washington, D.C.? Well, you see, grace changes everything. Grace, she takes the blame. She covers the shame, removes the stain. It could be her name. Grace, it's the name of a girl. It's also a thought that changed the world. Grace, she carries a pearl in perfect condition. What once was hers, what once was friction, what left the mark no longer Stains, because grace makes beauty out of ugly things. Grace finds goodness in everything. And today, through Hosea and Gomer, we understand grace changes everything. Thank you, and God bless.